Hey, welcome to the City Rev Life podcast. So glad you've joined us on this episode. My name is Pastor Roby, and I am here with my dear friend and um, someone who's been a mentor to me in my life and, and really opened the Bible up to me in ways that uh, I had never seen it really before is uh, my friend, Dr. Warren Gage, and one of my professors in, in seminary. And um, one of the things, Warren, that has meant so much to me through the years, and I know I can speak for so many other pastors and many other students who are exposed to your teaching, is how you show us where Jesus is all through the Bible from cover to cover. The, this, the Bible is a story about Jesus. And so um, we're, we're going to dig into a passage today that is uh, really, really powerful, a story of David and Goliath. And so, but really, I, your life work, I think, really is just showing people how to find Jesus in the Bible. Uh, it's my life work. Well, thank you. And it's been my joy, too. God, is, God has been very kind and gracious to me and allowing me to see the Savior. And that encourages my heart and encourage, I hopefully it, it will encourage others. So, Well, and I think especially in this season, you know, where we're facing difficult times and... Um, you know, all the time there are difficulties that are always changing you know, how they look. But there's a season right now that we're walking through really globally that is a challenging time. And I know in those seasons there's particular passages that we're drawn to. And so we're going to be looking at the story of David and Goliath because sometimes we feel like we're facing enormous odds. And so I want to share this, this passage, but I really want you to hear how uh, Warren unpacks this story, because I think this is really going to be an encouragement to you, whatever circumstances you're, you're walking through. So um, w as you're listening or viewing, if you're at a place where you can get your, your Bible out, maybe you're driving in your car, you're exercising, um, or maybe you're just there uh, listening at, at home or at your office, if you have the access to get a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 17. And so uh, where should we go first here, Warren? Well, I think the first thing we want to remember is that in chapter 16, the previous chapter, David was anointed by Samuel, and he is the youngest and the most disregarded of the sons of Jesse. Remember, mm -hmm. uh, Samuel came to anoint one of the sons of Jesse, and he had these uh, seven magnificent mature uh, sons. And David was the eighth and kind of out, you know, on the fields. And they didn't even bring him back home to meet the great prophet who'd come into the house of Jesse. But all those sons are paraded in front of Samuel, and he's blown away with their prowess and their form and their stature. And so surely the Lord's anointed is here, but not this one, and then not this one. And he goes right through and goes through the last one, and the Lord says, not this one either. And Samuel has to learn that lesson. Uh, God says to him, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And so he asks Jesse, Are, do you have any other sons? And he said, well, I'm just the one that's out there watching sheep, the youngest. And he said, we're not going to sit down until he comes. And so they summon him. And little David, in front of all of his older brothers, uh, receives the anointing to be king in Israel. That's neat. That's wonderful. The one that you don't regard you don't put too much store by, but that's the one God chooses. And I think we can all identify with that. It's, and so, so. it's so powerful because it's not just that. I mean, it's one thing if you all your brothers are lined up and you're the last one that your dad brings before Samuel. But it's another thing if they don't even bother to bring you in. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're clearly, you're looking for someone. I can't even be that guy. And so, um, I mean, this is this is not getting picked last for dodgeball. This is not even getting invited to the playground. I mean, this is like That's, the very end. So he is, David is, um, God looks differently on the hearts than, than man does. And we're thankful for that, yes. aren't we? We're taught to be thankful for that. So anyway, he's chosen to be king, and he's anointed by the prophet in chapter 16. And then the power of that anointing is really what, why we're told this account, given this account in chapter 17 which is a great battle that takes place with their, their perpetual and inveterate uh, enemies, the Philistines, who are always more powerfully armed because they have the secret of iron smelting. It's not yet the Iron Age, but they've, are, they've, they're technologically advanced. And if you have a sword of iron and I've got a sword of bronze, you can slice my sword in two with, with one stroke pretty easily. 
they're formidable people, and they're perpetually the enemies of God. And so there is a battle that's about to take place, and Saul, who is the uh, king at the time, uh, is leading the troops of, uh, of Israel. And uh, there's this place in Israel called the Valley of Elah, the Valley of the Terebinths, when we've been there. Mm-hmm. Remember, I took you there, and, and uh, there are two ridges, really, uh, the word Har in Hebrew means mountain, but it can also mean hill or ridge. And so there are two ridges uh, separated by a valley of about um, probably 300, 400 yards wide where the uh, where Goliath comes out. But on, one, on the ridge to the south, the Philistines are encamped. And on the ridge to the north, Israel is encamped with this valley, which is supposed to be the battlefield in between. And uh, interestingly, uh, when, when I took you there, it's still there. There's a brook that runs at the foot of the ridge where Israel is encamped. And in that brook, that's the brook from which David will take his five stones. And so when I take groups over there, they always want to go to that brook and pick up some stones. I guess there are a lot of Goliaths in the land. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's always fun to do. But you see, it really, is, it takes place in time time and space. This is real history that takes place. So the Israel, we can imagine them on the northern ridge and uh, the Philistines on the southern ridge. And, and you see the sign to Gath, which is still there. If you know Hebrew, you can read it. Uh, that is uh, still there. It's just about you know a few miles away from this particular scene. And uh, we're going to meet Goliath, who is from that Philistine city. But the Philistines are all arrayed there. And this Goliath is really quite a quite a character. You want to read about him? Um, it begins in verse four. Sure. And um, let's 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 give it a little bit of a read. Let's let's go down to verse seven. Okay. Sure. It says in verse four, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. Now, what does that tell you? This is a formidable dude, right? He's about nine feet tall, which is pretty... Awesome, uh, between eight and nine feet. Yeah, I mean, that, that alone, I don't care what his armor is. Yeah, like, I'm just terrifying. going. I'm going the different direction, but anyway, <laughs> uh, which Israel did, by the way. But anyway, he's, uh, he's got a very impressive physique and uh, height. But the interesting thing is the way he's described, and that is uh, he has this outsized, obviously, uh, armor, hmm. metallic armor, so that to make him invulnerable. And the key to the whole thing is that his confidence is clearly in his armor. Mm. Uh, That's going to be a difference. And when David goes against him, David's confidence is not in his armor. In fact, he he doesn't even wear it. But he has a bronze helmet. Everything is bronze. A bronze helmet, a coat coat of mail, these bronze greaves and javelin. The word bronze is important here because the, the Hebrew word for bronze is nehoshet. And that sounds, it's a homonym. It sounds like the Hebrew word for serpent, which is nachash. Mm. You remember the bronze serpent that Moses raised in the wilderness? The nachoshet nachash is what it is. Well, here um, he's wearing bronze, which sounds serpentine. It's, it's like copper and copperhead in English when we, we would think of the same kind of an idea. But it says that he comes out in scaled armor which intensifies his being identified with the serpent. Wow. So he is serpentine. He's bestial is the idea. And the one that's going to go against him is the young man, David, who's not old enough to be mustered into the army. Uh, his three older brothers are, but he's the eighth son, so he's quite a bit younger, and he's therefore identified with the tent of his mother. That means that the contest we have is between the seat of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Wow! It's a it's an enactment. It's a drama that's that's based on Genesis three fifteen, where it's the first plan of redemption in the Bible, the first announcement of the gospel. It's often called where God says, "I'll put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman," 
and to the seed of the woman, the, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the, um, the serpent, and then but will sustain a wound. In other words, when he's bringing down his heel, which will crush the, the serpent's head, and which is a lethal wounding, the serpent will strike him just before that fatal blow falls, and he's standing, which is the posture of victory in life. Mm -hmm. So a lot is implied in that story, but that's the background to this one. So we're going to see that story enacted. And if you know the, the prophecy and that this is rooted in Genesis 3.15, you can already predict the outcome of the battle. When you understand that David is in the seat of the woman line and Goliath is going to be in the uh, portrayed as the seat of the serpent. So you, you can predict what the outcome of is going to be of this battle. So. so so let's just take a step backwards. Let me make sure I'm tracking here. If we go back to Genesis 3, Genesis 3, <clears throat> Adam and Eve have uh, tasted the fruit. Uh, the serpent has, um, has tempted them. They fell into temptation. They've sinned. And then they're standing before God. And God is holding them uh, uh, accountable to that and telling them the consequences. And in that, it says... Um, that there will be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And then it says what will happen. It says mm -hmm. the seed of the woman will crush his head, um, but the serpent will strike the heel. And so mm -hmm. we know that that is this kind of um, prophecy that is hanging out there from Genesis 3 over the whole story of the Bible. So all of a sudden we get to 1 Samuel 17. We see this huge monstrous... Um, uh, soldier and champion who's got scaled armor his, and it's described with words that sound just like serpents. So we're seeing this kind of association with the serpent. And then we see young David who has not even been brought into the army yet. So he's young and he's associated with his mother. Mm -hmm. And so you see a, it's, you, it's a setup for us to see the something serpentine and something associated with uh, the seed of the, the woman. Seed of the woman. And yeah, that's right. And remember, it's in Genesis 3.15, but the consummation of that prophecy is Revelation 12, where the serpent of old, the dragon, is waiting for the woman who's in labor to bring forth the son, mm. remember? Yes. And then he's ready to d destroy the son, which speaks of Christ in a number of ways, but in his nativity, the serpent there is Herod that tries to kill the infant when he's born, you see, mm. remember that story. And so um, it's a theme that goes all the way through the Bible, but its occurrence here, it's informing the context because Goliath is clearly, I mean, he's the enemy, the, the Philistine champion who uh, mocks the God of Israel and mm -hmm. God's people, and he comes out dressed out. Um, the chronicler is, is, is dressing him out like a serpent, and so that's the idea. And he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul. So he says, choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. This is the age of heroes. Mm -hmm. And so they had what they call trial by single combat. You can think in, in Homer in the Iliad does that with Achilles and Hector. They're going to fight a battle, and the outcome of the battle will depend on how those two champions. So everybody doesn't have to, it's not a general slaughter. So Goliath says, you know, send one of your men out to fight me. And, and, you know, if we if we win, you'll be our slaves. If if you win, then we'll be your slaves. And so that's the, the, the whole the destiny of the nation is at stake here. And those are the odds. So when David will take to the the field of battle, he knows that he's undertaking this contest to save the whole people of Israel. Wow, that's an important point because ultimately the seed of the woman is one of David's sons. It's Christ, and when he goes to combat with the enemy, which is at the cross, uh, the history of all of us depends upon his victory in that battle. So we, we understand the larger context of the scripture, but here you understand it. So we're going to see a preview of that. Wow. So if we, we're able to fight, if he can kill me, we'll be your servants. If not, then you'll be our servants. And then he says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. You know, he wants a champion. And the one who should have gone, the one who is the giant in Israel, the one whose head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel is, of course, Saul, who's cowering in his tent. He doesn't, he doesn't want to go out to battle against Goliath. Yeah, because it literally says that Saul was a very tall person. Yeah, the tallest in Israel. So, I mean, he's the giant. He's the one who 
And of course, he's the king, so he's the one who should represent right. uh, the people, but he, he doesn't have the faith mm -hmm. that we will see that is the basis of what David does. So everybody hears that, and they're all dismayed and greatly afraid. So this doesn't look good for the home team, does it? It's, <laughs> they're all terrified. And, and David was the son of a, uh, an Ethervite from Bethlehem in Judah. His name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years. And the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. So they're in the army, mm -hmm. but, you know, the other sons are not. And uh, David was the youngest. And so David went... Uh, and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So he comes out twice a day for 40 days. 40 in the Bible is the number of trial and testing. And so here, are you going to provide a champion or are we just going to sit here forever? You know, come on, guys, bring someone out to fight with me. And Jesse said to his son David, take now for yourself the brothers and ephah this dried grain, so they live off the land. They, you know, they don't have commissaries or anything like that. They have to, the people would supply them. So here is David's father sending his son with gifts for the people of God. Does that sound familiar? Oh, wow. And the real gift is going to be his special son, David, as we'll see. So anyway, they carry these cheeses to the captain of the thousands and see your brother's fair and bring back news of them. So Saul and all the men were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines although they're really sitting more than fighting, but at this point. So David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the sheep keeper. He took care of what his charge was. He was a shepherd, a unique son of his father, who was bearing gifts. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. And Israel and all the Philistines were drawn up in battle array, army against army. And so um, when Goliath comes out for his two, twice daily taunt of Israel, David hears it. Wow. He talked with the, the people that when he was there. When David arrived, Goliath came out, and uh, David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So that means what? They have no faith. No faith in God, no faith in who they are. Um, they have faith. Uh, a lady once taught me this, uh, this lesson. I, didn't, I never really thought about it. But they do have faith, but their faith is... Um, expressed in their fear of the enemy. Their, f their faith is in the enemy. Wow. You see? I mean, a lack of faith is not just an, an positively, it's positively negative. Right. When we are afraid, we're, we, we're expressing our faith in the enemy because he's oh, wow. going to prevail. I think that's a significant insight. Yeah, because we don't know what the future is going to hold. Hmm. But if we're fearful, then that means that we're expecting the enemy to win. Yeah, exactly. No, we do know what the future will hold. I think we have the faith to, to know that at the end of the day, the battle is going to be won. But, but in this life, God has ordained ups and downs, and we have to strap on our seatbelt. So, uh, but but it, it, as long, if you live in the confidence that, that your faith is going to be honored and God is going to keep his promises, then that you will address life totally differently. And faith, I think, along with love, casts out fear. See? Because mm -hmm. you'll see that with David. David has faith. And there's a ground for his faith. It's not, you know, just conjured up from nowhere. But um, we'll, we'll see. We, well, in fact, we could talk about that now, I guess. What is the basis of David's faith? David knows a great secret. What is that secret? The reader should know it. David has been anointed by God's holy prophet to be king in Israel. Mm. Well, he's not yet king. If he's killed, what? God's mm. word is of no effect. But if God has promised him he will be king, wow. then he can go into the battle knowing he's invincible. Isn't that right? Wow. Until he is finally anointed king, which happens many years later. So David knows that. Now, it's one thing to know it. He can, we know the promises of God, but David actually believes it, and that's the strength of his power. He believes the word of God, and so he's able to tackle this, you know, monster of a man. Mm. So anyway, so um, let's see what happens. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter 
and give his father's house exemption from taxes. And his, that's, those are pretty good deals. Those are, yes. you know, I'd sign up, I guess, until I saw Goliath maybe. But this, this says something interesting. David hears all of this and he says, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine? And they told him this for this uh, uncir uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. So David knows that if he defeats this enemy, he's going to receive a bride, a royal bride. Does that tell you something about what is the reward of Christ if he goes out in single combat against the, the great Satan, the great enemy? Uh, what is his reward? Hmm. You are. You see, it's all the same. It's, the, it's, it's fighting the dragon, slaying the dragon in order that the, the bride can be rescued. That's the idea. So he's going to have a royal bride, and he's a young man, so that's got some significance. Some cachet, do we say, mm -hmm. that, that counts with him? So the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be for the man who kills him. Now his older brothers, he's got three of them, Eliab, hear David um, saying, Why did you come down here? And they say, with, Who did you leave those sheep with? You know, charging him with folly. You know, <laughs> and well, he, he, you know, the, the chronicler has told us he, he took care of all the business at home, but he did this at the instruction of his father. And he says, I know the pride and insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. Probably David's brothers are jealous of him because mm -hmm. they were there to witness this little punk guy being anointed by the great prophet to be king in Israel. So I think there's, there's brotherly in, in, enmity there, but at the same time, what does that mean? He, his own brothers are rejecting him, Wow. see, and will not accept his, his promise to be king. So they have no faith. Anyway, so David said, what have I done? There's no cause for you to be angry, basically. So he turned from them toward another. I mean, his brothers rejected him. Jesus would know that. Yeah, you know, remember, he came into his own. His own received him not. Mm -hmm. And when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported to Saul, there's someone who's ready to go up against Goliath. So Saul is thrilled. He's been waiting for 40 days and suffering humiliation. Count to 40 and think about that. Twice a day, Goliath is mocking God and, and Saul is cowardly. So David said to Saul, let no man's heart. So he summoned David and David comes in and I can see that David, imagine when David comes into the tent, this is the guy that's going to fight Goliath. And he's a scrawny little shepherd boy, you know, and, you're th and probably Saul is crestfallen thinking, Oh, this can't be the champion. I mean, the outward appearance says, yep. I mean, this is this the best we got? He must be crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suspect he thought he was mad. So, so anyway, David said to him, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Look at the humility of that, your servant. Mm. He's the one that's really going to be the legitimate because the spirit immediately left Saul and went to David. So he's the... Um, but it's still promissory. He's not going to touch God's anointed. He's not going to try to advance the schedule. He's going to wait on God to do it. Mm -hmm. So, and Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're, a, you're just a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth, like Saul. <laughs> but anyway, you can't do this. You're too young. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting, I think, in and of itself. We don't put any store by you. I mean, that'd be a humiliation to send you out there. We'd be inviting defeat. So David said, uh, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when the lion or the bear came, they took a lamb out of the flock. I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard. Now that's bravery. I'm sorry. Wow. I'm not going to take a lion by its beard. That's just, uh, that's not me. But I'm not ordained to be king in Israel either. So anyway, <laughs> And struck it and killed it. That's incredible. The lion and the bear, by the way, there was a land bridge to... Uh, to Palestine at this time. And so the, the animals from sub-Saharan Africa made their way up there. We, we found bones of lions and bears all over. You don't find them now, but they were oh, wow. uh, 2000, you know, 1000 BC. So anyway. I mean, he's talking about like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Combat with, with lions, lions and, and bear. bears, yeah. So he has been a warrior from his youth in a sense. Well, he's got a prowess about him. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he's trying to encourage David to let him go to battle. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. That's where David knows he's got him. I mean, 
can you defy the armies of the living God? Who's the real giant in the land? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, he's got his categories right, which means he can address the circumstances right. You got to have your categories right. You got to have your faith in the right position mm-hmm. in a time like this. So David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the... See, the, he's attributing it to God, not to his prowess. Mm. The Lord who delivered me, saved me, is another word for that, from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Well, the Lord will show. He can deliver Daniel from the lions and Mm -hmm. Paul from the lions. All of that's part of that theme. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. So he's dressing him up like the serpent. And you can think that's got to be really gangly and awkward looking because Saul is so huge and David is not. And David's, you know, loincloth like the shepherd. And so Saul puts all this armor on him, which tells you something. What does that tell you? He doesn't have faith, the same faith. Saul's confidence is the same thing that Goliath's confidence is in. Mm. See? And if we begin to look at military and stack them up, we'll be afraid of our enemy. Um, That's not where it's not by the sword or the strength of a man, but by by his spirit that he gives victory in the day of battle. So David said to Saul, I can't walk with these for I've not tested them. So David took them off. So he takes off that armor, Mm -hmm. which means he's going to go in the nakedness of the loincloth like a shepherd. I mean, he's totally vulnerable. Um, His confidence is not in the armor at all. So he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And we saw those smooth stones because it's a wadi. They they have water running in it. And put them in a shepherd's bag in the pouch which he had. The Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked, look at this. Why don't you read that? How did the Philistine respond when he saw the great champion of Israel coming forth? And it's this little... Scrawny David guy. Uh, let me read verse uh, 41 and 42. And when the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him, and when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistines, the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Yeah, I think this is interesting. He despises him because he's a youth which Saul had judged him the same way, mm. ruddy and good-looking, which means he doesn't have the scars of battle. Oh. Because to the warrior, the scars of, you can think of the Prussian, uh, you know, fencers and all of that, the scars are your, the mark of manliness. And so, you know, here's David. He's just a young, good-looking kid. And, and David, Goliath doesn't like that much. So he says, you know, am I a dog that you come with, against me with sticks? And the answer to that is what? Yes. Yeah, you're a dog. That's exactly, you're a beast and you're going to, you're going to have the fate of the beast. Dogs were not cute, cuddly, like my little, you know, uh, Cavalier, King Charles Cavalier. Speaking they of marks of nasty. Huh? Uh, what? You're a little dog. You have a little dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying, speaking of marks of manliness, you have a cute little dog. That's right. I don't have a <laughs> Doberman or whatever, but anyway. Am I a dog that you come with sticks and the Philistine curse David by his gods? And the Philistine, which means what? The curses of the Philistine gods are are nothing. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. That's pretty terrifying. I mean, he's all talk. He's all bark, I guess. Mm -hmm. And anyways, we'll see. So David said to the Philistine, now this is that little guy talking, the comic hero talking to this great champion. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. That's the power of the story. It's unbelievable. It's not in the implements of battle. His victory is in, I mean, it's his faith in God. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is his military name, his military metaphor, hosts of armies. That's the one that's, that's really opposing Goliath. Mm. This day, and this is, look at the strength of this. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Why? Because he knows the prophecy. Mm. See? Remember that? 
he's, his head's going to be crushed. So anyway, I will take you, I'm going to cut your head off, he says. Of course, he doesn't have a sword, as we'll see. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. So all the camp of the Philistines is hearing this, and they're thinking, uh, you know, everybody's laying their wagers, and I mean, odds are probably pretty bad for, for the home team and for David. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. This is fabulous language. These are the stories, the hero stories our people need to hear, mm -hmm. because they speak of a greater hero who comes, who wins an even greater battle. So it was when the Philistine arose and came to draw near to meet David, that David hurried and ran again to the army to meet the Philistines. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he flung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead. What does that mean? It's crushed. His skull is crushed, which is the prophecy, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, and stuns him, and he falls on the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Well, what happened to all that bronze armor? And struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David, so you have to make do with what you do, right? So David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his own sword, and drew it out of the sheath. This is humiliating. And, and killed him with it. And then the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. They fled. Yeah, I think that's what they do. If a little boy, think of the logic of this. If a little boy can beat our great champion, what are we going to stand against all the men of Israel? So all the odds shift. What David does is he cuts off his head, and then he holds it up by the hair and shows it to the camp of the Philistines. That's the... The mark of the champion, that means the battle of the uh, giants, the battle of the, the single combat is over. Mm. And so um, all the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley of the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Now, that's, and then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. You, you, you take the plunder uh, after the victory. But David, because he's, a, he's, he's had single combat victory, he's entitled to everything that belonged to Goliath. So he took the head of the Philistine. That's a charming trophy, I think, you know. That's, That's nice. what anyone would do. <laughs> take the, the severed head of this uh, giant. And, but look at what the chronicler records. He took the sword also. That occurs later in his story, you might remember, when he's mm -hmm. fleeing from Saul. But it says, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put his armor in his tent. Now, that verse is often overlooked, but that's the key to the whole thing. Why in the world would he take the head of Goliath to Jerusalem? First of all, Jerusalem is a Jebusite city. Right. Remember, David is going to take it. So it's a Canaanite city. It's Why not would a part he... of Israel at this point. No, it's not a part of Israel, but David's already marked it out. He knows he's going to be king, and he knows that's going to be his city. Why is that going to be? That's where the Lord is going to cause his name to dwell. So when he goes to Jerusalem, he doesn't go in the city with the head. He can't. He can't enter the gate. So he goes to a place outside of the gate of Jerusalem. That's important. There is a place outside of the gate of Jerusalem where he knows where the battle will be, the great cosmic battle will take place. And that place is named Moriah. It's a hill outside of Jerusalem where Abraham offered up Isaac in sacrifice. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And God said at that place, the lamb of God would be provided, the sacrifice, that would, the lamb that would destroy the, the serpent of old. So it had tremendous pr prophetic significance. So David takes the head of Goliath, outside of the gate of Jerusalem. The Hebrew word for skull, this is what he has, is Galgelet. But its homonym for the name of that hill, the place of the skull, is Goliath of Gath becomes Golgotha. Wow. See that? Mm -hmm. And he buries the skull of Goliath there because David knows that one of his sons, actually descendants' sons, will be the seed of the woman that will in truth crush the head of the serpent. On that hill, the place of the skull, and what he's doing is he's showing and leaving a testimony for all time that he knows that God will give victory, and the victory that he was given, that's important. He didn't 
win it or earn it. He, he says, God will give you into my hands to Goliath. Remember, the victory he took that day, he had that day, was attributable to God. And it was a token and a prefiguring of the battle that Jesus, the true son of David, um, would ultimately win over the serpent enemy uh, when he became the Lamb of God that, that uh, takes away the sin of the world. So, tremendous so, story. Okay, we got to go back over that last part there. You, so, David goes to what, to maybe some of his contemporaries might seem, a random Canaanite city. He goes to Jerusalem. He's out, he can't go into Jerusalem because it's a Jebusite city um, and, you know, it's a foreign city, uh, so he can't go in there. So he's outside of Jerusalem, which is, that is already significant, we know, from earlier in Genesis because that's where uh, Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac, and um, that was right in there. So there's a significant spot that's got a prophecy hanging over it. You're saying, this is, this is pointing to, David then takes this skull of this serpentine enemy monster... And he, he leaves it there at this specific spot in, um, in outside of Jerusalem. And that the, the name of that spot is then, or at least sounds similar or derived from this because you've got Golgotha and it's like a shortening of Goliath of Gath. Yes, that's how some of the early, early church took it that way. All, it's related really technically to Golgelet, which means skull. See? Place of the skull, but the, the place of the skull. But it's not a place of a skull. It's the place of the skull. What is the definitive article there? What does that mean? What skull is it the place of? And the only skull that's referenced with regard to a place outside of Jerusalem, outside of the gate of Jerusalem, this it's. I think it's the place. It's Moriah, which we know is a hill. So in the New Testament, we're told. Uh, they go to the place of the skull, Golgelet, mm -hmm. which is what that is. Is that the Hebrew or Aramaic? That's yeah. The place Golgotha is is well, it's actually Aramaic, but it's it's uh, based on the same root, Golgelet. Golgelet. It's called Calvary. Calvaris is the Latin word for skull. Okay, so it's the place of the skull, and you're saying, well, what skull? And you're saying, we'll go back to this story. There is a very significant skull that is buried just outside of Jerusalem. And you can see the idea of Gol, Golgath um, or Golgotha, and you see Goliath of Gath. So David is planting the skull, the head of Goliath, on the spot where Jesus, the son of David, will be crucified and ultimately win the victory for our salvation. Exactly, yes. Unbelievable. Yeah. So... I mean, there's so many things in here. Here's the, the, the seed. We've already talked about how Goliath is associated with the serpent and the beast. We've got David, who is the, the son, uh, seed of the woman that uh, he's sent from the father. He will win the bride and he will defeat, he will crush the head of the serpent and he will win the, va the victory for all of his people. His victory wins. David's victory is a representative. If he wins, mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. people win. And David wins, and so all of his people wins. And all of that is pointing to that one moment, ultimately, where the son of David will be sent from the father, will win the victory over the beast yeah. and the serpent. And he, his victory will be applied to all of us. And, and, and here's the part, this time through this story, Warren, that is just really striking to me, is that he would consider us a prize to be won. Mm -hmm. And not merely a prize, but he will make of us a royal bride. We all become um, royal. I mean, that's our destiny. Wow. Even though we're part of the commonality, you know, we're, we become a royal bride. Whatever our history, whatever, whatever it was, I mean, the love of Jesus is unbelievable. Hmm. I mean, David was hoping to get and did get one of the daughters of Saul, much to his regret in many ways. <laughs> but, but Jesus will get the bride, the bride that is the wish of his own heart, uh, the one he redeemed and made us like him. So our destiny is royal and our victory is certain. And we can live life in, in the confidence that knowing if that's our destiny, if that's prophetically the word that's spoken over us, that that is who we are. And because of our faith in him, then 
no power on earth can defeat us mm-hmm. because he's already overcome the world. Mm-hmm. And so we live in faith, not fear. Uh, faith like love casts out fear. So that doesn't mean you're reckless. That would be folly. But, but you understand that whatever comes against you in this life, the Lord will overturn it mm-hmm. and, and make it good. Maybe not in this life, but certainly in the life mm-hmm. to come. Sometimes in this life, sometimes there are great deliverances and victories uh, like God gave to Israel. Mm-hmm. But, um, but whatever happens, even, if, even in death, that becomes a great victory in him. So. You know, often we read this, pa- this passage and we study this and we, we walk away with, hey, so try to be like David. Um, and there's some things to model that David did, you know, faith and, and uh, trusting the Lord to fight our battles and uh, to be the ultimate warrior. And, you know, a lot of times we read this and say, try to be like David, but in a maybe even more truer sense, this passage is saying David was, was like Jesus. And the, the takeaway is Jesus has already won the battle. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we, can, we can have faith and walk in whatever circumstances that the Lord allows to be brought our way, knowing that Jesus has already won. I think in the takeaway, too, we talked about this a little bit before, and that is that you can't take it away from David. David has confidence and faith in mm-hmm. God, which is good and noble, and that's the basis of his victory. But this victory only is a shadow of mm-hmm. the greater victory that came when a far greater than David, mm. uh, by David's own confession, he, he called his son his Lord, remember? Psalm 110, uh, David's son was going to be greater than David himself because he goes against a far greater enemy mm-hmm. with far greater uh, odds at stake. I mean, our whole salvation, our whole hope of everything, of heaven, of being delivered from the wrath of God because of our uh, repentance, Everything is at stake, Mm -hmm. everything that could possibly be at stake, but that battle's already been won. So we can live in the confidence of knowing that a greater champion has come and that greater champion loves us and we are his exceeding great reward. We are his bride, Mm. bridal people. And our future is the marriage supper of the lamb. It's not, it's not the grave Mm -hmm. because he's, he has the keys of death in Hades. He's defeated the, the, the lion that that goes around seeking who may may devour. He's defeated the lion on our behalf that accuses us. All of that, he's won. And so we can live in light of that victory. And that gives you a a real confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn from David who had confidence in the prophecy of Samuel. We've got all the scripture that foretells and prophesies the word of God, Mm -hmm. what our eternal destiny is that's that's going to be glorious. So Mm -hmm. um, anyway... David and Goliath. Well, well, Warren, thank you so much for for your encouragement to us. I hope this was an encouragement to you, and um, I encourage you to go back and and think through uh, 1 Samuel 17, the story of of, uh, David and Goliath, which is a a shadow of a much greater story, a story that involves you. Hey, thanks for joining us on the City Rev Life podcast. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on City Rev Life. You can subscribe to this podcast, rate and review wherever you're listening to this. And we love it when you share it with your friends on social media. For more videos and content, go ahead and check us out at cityrev.org slash podcast or download our City Rev Church app. Have a great day.